Welcome back to the City Life Family Podcast. We want to equip ministry leaders, young and old, for the work of ministry. So thank you for tuning in again today. Today, we are talking about uh, friendship. Uh, I'm Chris Ruska, co-lead pastor here at City Life Omaha. I'm with my friend, Matthew. So Matthew, uh, who are you? How did you get here? What do you do? What's your background? Introduce yourself real quick. Yeah, my name is Matt Lapine, and I am the director of uh, Christian education at uh, Midtown, but also of men's ministry here at City Light Omaha. That's awesome. Um, my background is I, I'm from Minnesota, but I've been all over the country doing various things. Uh, but most recently, I, we were in Chicago area. I was doing a PhD at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Yeah. So we, yeah, we're really excited to be here. And um, it's been really fun to, to engage, especially, uh, I know we've worked together yes. with the men's ministry stuff, um, yeah. with Bible studies, and then... Yeah. At, on this topic also, we had that uh, talk about friendship yes. uh, for our men's gathering. So, yeah. so Matt, um, you could be in a lot of different places doing a lot of different things. So we're going to get to friendship. But I just want to hear you. You're in the chair. I want to ask you this question. Why are you in a local church? Why do you want to serve local churches and help equip local churches to think rightly theologically about God, doctrine, uh, and how that flushes itself out in practice? So that's what you want to give your life to. You've read some books. You've done some study. You could be in a lot of different places. And um, and yet you're saying, I want to be within the local church. So why why is that? Yeah, I've already, I've always said that I think the local church is the Super Bowl. Like that's that's where you'd yeah. like to I'd like to be. And the reason is because, um, you know, I'm a theologian. I I think theologically and abstractly about a lot of things. Yeah. But um, I'm married to a woman who is as practical as it gets. And so my entire <laughs> yes. marriage has been a struggle of me <laughs> saying, "Hey, isn't this cool?" And she's like, "What does that mean?" And yes. what she means is, "How does that work out?" Yes. And to me, the the divide between seminary and church is growing because the seminary is not getting practical on mm-hmm. issues like what we're talking about here. And churches desperately need answers to the complaints culture that we're in. And so really, I want to think from top to bottom, like what does uh, the Bible say? Uh, How do we, how do we sort of distill that teaching, Mm. but also how do we live that teaching? How do we embody it on a local level? Yeah. I love that. So um, before we get into the topic of friendship, let's get into our friendship. So uh, let's take people into the good and the bad of our relationship. So how did we, how did we even connect? And I would love to hear from you markers. So this is a great little test because this is a little narrative where people can learn from. Yeah. Because literally me and Matt randomly met, we've known each other or known of each other probably less than a year. And I would say, Matt, we've moved from strangers to friends uh, in less than a year. And so what? how has that happened? You know what I mean? Like my world has become better because I know you and your family. I look forward to being in the same rooms with you. I enjoy conversations. I notice when your family and wife is in the church and and want to help them feel connected and have a unique burden to make them feel connected and brought into the church. So so how did we get there? How, what were some things that were like, these were markers in our, our friendship? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it started with a random call when I was in Texas uh, <laughs> from this guy who was, you know, really excited. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I, you know, we, I was uh, at a conference actually talking about how to do these things. Yeah. Um, but it was also in sort of a weird space where I, I knew I was going to have to transition voc- yeah. uh, vocationally. And, um, you know, h- having that sort of background of, of just disease about what does the church actually think about theology. Yeah. Uh, I remember my first impression of you was here's a guy who's humble and willing yeah. to admit kind of where there have been some misses and really seems to want to value the things that yeah. I give. And so I felt a lot of value from that conversation yeah. um, and really felt um, that, you know, this was the sort of place where I, I felt like maybe I could trust. Mm-hmm. And um, so, I mean, I think that's two big things right yes. from the go- get go is that uh, we had a great conversation, relational connection, but I also felt like I trusted you yep. and felt like there was an invitation or an openness yeah. to more relationship, right? Yeah. yeah, I would say a couple other markers. That was a really fun conversation and I have hung up the phone just saying, oh my goodness, I really hope the Lord would call him and his family to come partner with City Light. And uh, you are a unique answer to prayer. So Matt's just passion is equipping the saints and caring for the weak and has a story of really both, which is a really beautiful combination when you have somebody who's really thoughtful theologically, but 
but suffered in life enough to also have eyes to see who's the sufferer among us. And so that that was something that got me excited. And then I would remember just even in the process of like having dinner with you and your wife and getting to know your girls. And I think what you modeled is is you were just so much more than just an academically minded guy, which which by the way is a gift to the church that we have people who want to think rightly about God. But but also just the uniqueness to take yourself off of any pedestal very quickly and say, so much of my learning has happened in the context of my marriage. So much of my learning has had to come in and kind of figuring out what do I do with these pains and these tensions? And uh, I don't know, man, it, just that authenticity really drew us together. So yeah. I, other markers would just be, we've tabled together. Like we've had you over, you had us over. Um, those little steps of friendship have been great. So. All that to say is Matt has become a friend and uh, this could be awkward because I'm calling him a friend and I don't know if he would define me as a friend, but I'm now <laughs> defining the relationship. Yes, yes. yes, I'm in, officially in. So now back to friendship. Now, why yeah. why do we need to talk about this in this cultural moment? You know, I just I just want to ask that question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we talked about the, the men's gathering, and I know this is this goes beyond men, but yeah. but especially for men, there's um, there's a, a real famine of friendship right now. There's yeah. fewer friends that are happening, um, and a lot of times, you know, it's because we're not making priority of it. Yep. But I think a, another big uh, cultural reason is that we we so value our freedom as mm. as individuals in America. We want to be mobile. We don't want to respond back to the text message just in case something else comes, or we want to be free to switch jobs or switch places. And so we so value our freedom that we don't actually just make this commitment. Uh, yeah. We don't see it as a necessary thing to make friends. But I think a lot of people are feeling it. Uh, so I'd be curious, like when I proposed that idea about our men's gathering to you, like what, what was your answer to that question? Why did that seem to resonate with you? Yeah, well, this could get awkward on the podcast, but uh, I am, I, so I, I think it resonated with me for a couple of reasons. I look at my stages of life. Friendship was kind of the most beautiful and uh, healthy, probably in college, just living in community with godly men who spurred each other on, had fun, shared experiences. We were on mission together at the campus. Like it was just a really great time. You had every weekend to go on adventures and then you kind of step into the young adult stage. Everybody gets jobs. So now you've got limited time to build those relationships. Then you add a wife and kids and responsibilities and coaching. And, and now all of a sudden, my window for friendship gets smaller. The cost becomes higher. Uh, the barriers become just scheduling. And it's no longer I'm working too much or it's, it's really good things. Like I need to be with my wife tonight or I need to be investing with my kids. Or uh, so, so that window to relationship gets smaller and that means that your social circles get smaller. And so if I realize really quickly, if I'm not intentional about inviting other people into my life and saying, I need you, I need to put this on my schedule. I'm going to spend time and money to get there. And I'll probably sacrifice sleep to make it happen. I am going to drift into an individual who is known by many, but isolated in my own world. And that's actually a really dangerous place to get um, where people know things about me. Um, people experience my leadership on stage, but they don't necessarily, I'm not known. Um, and so I, I feel that is uh, a burden I carry for so many in the church, men and women, uh, people who, especially in a social media culture, uh, where we can know a lot of things about each other, but really not disclose our burdens, our pain points, our struggles, our anxieties. And uh, and then there's statistics. Can I be honest, Matt? I, I'm, I look at some of the data about how many people have one good friend, two good friends? What are the rhythms of friendship? Do they have the tools to practice gospel-centered friendship? Have, have A lot of people, especially in Nebraska, um, in our middle Midwest culture, their parents had no vision for friendship. It was survival, it was accomplishment, it was do better than the previous generation. Friendship might not have um, been valued. So we're trying to live this thing out. So, yeah. so all that, that resonated with me and said, we've got to talk about this. We've got to be a family of churches talking about friendship. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, there, there's, there's risks about being in that situation too, mm. right? I mean, it, in some ways the story that you're telling is, is not, 
you're not side by side very often with other men, right? right? And right. and I do think that in in previous generations that didn't require the level of intentionality that it does now, right? Yep. And um, you know something that corresponds with that is we're actually seeing a, a tremendous rise in mental health difficulties yeah. um, from the the lack of friendship. There's uh, you know when you're in a space where you've got things that you you want to share or you yep. need to share, it's a, a burden on your heart. Um, primarily, it, it's uh, for men. Again, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to keep talking about men, but yes. for, primarily for men, that person that you can share with is a spouse. And if you right. don't have a spouse, who who else is it going to be? Yeah. And then the spouse uh, has a hard time carrying that burden. So there's there's mental health risks, but there's also I think spiritual risks yeah. that because uh, our spiritual relationships are actually vital to mm-hmm. to our spiritual growth. I mean, Ephesians four talks about how each one of us and the connections between us yes. are like joints and ligaments. So maybe you want to speak to that. Like what sort of risks, maybe just in general, but also for someone in ministry yeah. are there uh, spiritually? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one risk is just isolating out of a fear of being known, right? So it's like uh, you can isolate, you can avoid sharing your worst. What happens if I open up about the context of my marriage? What happens if I tell people I parented in anger and not in gentleness? What happens if I confess to somebody I'm dealing with my own doubts? Um it, do people run away from me? Do they have grace for me? Uh, and so I think what's all too often common is is the structural ministries that we build, you become more disconnected from people and you become a king isolated in a castle. And so unless you're <laughs> kind of pushing against that, um, the, maybe the more gifted, the more time you're in ministry, whatever that may be, you can find yourself on an island. And so isolation can happen. Uh, secrets can happen. I, I can't keep that out because what would happen if I'd let somebody in on that? Uh, or honestly, one of the things you have to push against is is um, the risk of just associating with people that are just like you. So uh, what I've noticed is there were people that would have never called me 10 years ago uh, to hang out for dinner, but now the church has gone uh, marginally well and uh, and so it seems like I have something to offer. And so you get these phone calls and these invitations to social circles that you might not have got previously. And now all of a sudden you find yourself in arenas where um, you don't, you're not in relationship with the poor. You're not in relationship with the weak. You're not in relationship with the mentally ill because you're, you're more isolated with like people. And so as a ministry leader, I've had to say, how do I not just be the token spiritual friend around all these accomplished people? Um, how do I model my friendships after the gospel where Jesus seemed to make room for people who didn't have much to offer him uh, and experience friendship with Peter, <laughs> like this yeah. guy who said yeah. the wrong thing all the time. So, so how do you, yeah, how do you and, work and against And the that? disciples were teenagers, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I think something that's related to that also is that when you get in a position of authority, you tend to be the one pursued. Yeah. Like you don't actually need to go out and, yeah. and act with intentionality. You can fill your calendar without ever doing that. Yes. But you can also then get to a point where you there's no relational mutuality. Like yeah. like I, I, I don't need to uh, tell the truth or I don't need to ask for help or yeah. I don't need to confess weakness. I can yeah. just sort of stay in this cocoon cocoon of protection, yes. Yes. which you, you think is safe, but actually you, you could find yourself in a place where something's eating away at the inside of you because you're yes. just isolated and you don't have uh, that trusted friend to go to, to really lean on in those situations when you actually encounter your humanness yeah. and your weakness. Come on. Right? So you had mentioned kind of this culture where we're moving more than normal. Okay, so is there any cultural barriers that you would put your finger on and say, pay attention to this, right? I think you talked about kind of autonomy, kind of one of keeping our options open. The other kind of being this sense of like, I can just move. I'm very mobile. And like we move neighborhoods, right? So you might not move cities, but you're moving neighborhoods all the time. You're moving companies all the time, moving school districts all the time. And so those relationships get uprooted and start all over. People transfer churches uh, often. And that, again, creates a level of isolation. So, um, yeah, what are some of the other ones you would touch on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we I, that one actually is much bigger than I think we realize. Yeah. And, and the reason is because I don't think that we have an adequate idea of how much the world has changed in the last 30 years. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it could go back even f- further than 30 years. I mean, if like the car was one of the right. things that changed the modern world the most, right? Yep. <laughs> so wh- why can we just skip to another church? Well, it's because 
We don't have to walk to church. Exactly. We, we, we can drive, and we drive by probably four or five churches on our way to church, right? Yep. And so it just puts us in a position where everything that we do is elective. Like, yes. I'm choosing to do this. I'm choosing to do that. Yep. And what that does, then, is it gives us this framework that our default framework is, what can I get from this person? Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so the... the, the uh, I think essentially what what you get into is you get into these sort of uh, status games yeah. where where you're just sort of vying for uh, relational superiority, but you're also just you see all your fr- friendships as networking. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you're that you know sort of top person in the uh, in the food chain, uh, you can interact with an endless amount of interesting people yeah. because people will take your calls or people will call you, yeah. but you don't have to go down the ladder. Right. Um, but but actually, I think a lot of spiritual growth happens when we interact with people who are lowly <laughs> yes. and we find ourselves meeting someone who is like us, human and fallible, yes. and, and can teach us um, to, uh, to to have the eyes of faith in a, in a much more profound way than yes. the, the wealthy will. Yes. And so um, the point that I'm trying to make, though, is the, the fact that we're mobile <laughs> yes. is what prevents us from being sort of forced into those sorts of relationships. Yes. Like, uh, we have to choose to right. make a covenant. It, we, we're not just in relationship with someone because we're with them, yes. because we could be anywhere, hypothetically. Right. Right. And so I, I think in the church, that's one of the real challenges is to, is to get people to make that choice, to elect, to to be committed to relationships, yes. <laughs> even though the, even if those are relationships are difficult, yes. it's just so easy just to 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 sort of walk away from relationship rather than to allow the difficulty to strengthen you, yeah, and uh, to strengthen your bond, but also to 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 remake you, to to reform you into the image of Christ and how you uh, uh, speak the truth or right. receive right. the truth yes. or yes. Uh, apologize, and and all those things are things that we've sort of lost the skill of doing because we can just get up and move to the next person. Exactly. Yep. And so we've talked a lot about this off off this moment, but the autonomy we have, we want to protect. We want to be the king of our schedule and the king of who we let in our lives. So, and you see this, I mean, I try to initiate relationship with people and they're too busy and they wait. And so they're, they're basically saying, don't infringe on my time. I'll let you know when I'm ready. And that's a barrier. Um, this mobile, right? Like people have come and gone, pastors have come and gone, friends have come and gone. And sometimes in a church planning church, we want yeah. that. Yeah, we, yeah. In, a, in a culture, we want that, but that also can mean there's a loss of relationship. And uh, obviously then the transactional nature, just really, that is the world's grid. What can this person give me? And we as Christians are being sold that. And if we don't recognize that narrative and push against it with a different gospel narrative, we can fall right into that too. So yeah. what does the Bible yeah. have to say about this? I want to kind of get into that. Well, yeah, that's a great, great transition because, I mean, I think the opposite, if, if if that sort of what can I get from this relationship, yeah. the opposite that the Bible offers is membership. Right. So I'm especially thinking of 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. Yeah. Um, but Ephesians 4 touches on it. Colossians 2 touches on it. Um, membership is neither collectivism nor individualism. Mm. It, it's it's I'm an individual, but I belong to a group. Yeah. And, and what I bring to that group is unique in the sense that everybody's bringing a gift to the group, but the group is strengthened by the diversity and the unity that exists in the diversity. Come on. And so, like, when someone asks you, like, how are you doing, we have this individualistic assumption that, oh, they, they must be asking about me yes. because we don't really see ourselves as part of a group. Right. Like, we don't ask, like, what's the health of my group or, or things like that, yep. you know, yep. or at least not, not very commonly. But um, membership uh, doesn't prioritize status. Like, mm. if you've got a hierarchy within a, a group, uh, I mean, so at some level, hierarchy has to exist. But that sort of status hierarchy, when yep. it exists, the group is pretty dysfunctional. Mm. Uh, groups exist because there's different people playing different roles, yes. but each person is valuable. I'm, yep. I'm basically just... <laughs> exegeting 1 Corinthians 12. Yes, here. you are. Yes. And so there has to be mutuality of need and there has to be mutuality of honor yes. and especially to the people who who right. kind of seem to be the, the less honorable members, the more dishonored yeah. members, um, because it matters that there's unity. That's what yes. 1 Corinthians 12 says, is that you, you honor the weaker members so that there won't be disunity. Yeah. And so that that image of membership is really essential. But the question is, how do we get people to actually step into that mm-hmm. and and live that? Uh, because there's so much beauty and freedom in that. Yeah. But we prize our sort of individual autonomous freedom. Yes. And our lives sometimes take really ugly shapes because yes. of that. Yes. Yes. No, I lo- I love the way you built that out. Just as the body of Christ, we're 
you know, I just think about when we walk in the room, how do you see yourself? Am I this person of position and power or am I just another adopted son and daughter, a member of this body that has one unique gift that the Holy Spirit has given me for the glory of God and the good of my brothers and sisters? And so whatever that role is, we play it, whether it's high or low, right? So if my contribution to the church is stacking chairs after this, awesome. If it's preaching a sermon in front of thousands, whatever role that is, I'll play it to the glory of God and the good of my brothers and sisters. And so I think that's that's a healthy way to look at this and and then say in friendship, coming in and saying, this is not just transactional. The gospel frees me to give to you. And my gospel gives me, you know, like Jesus becomes the pattern. And that's where we say, what does the Bible have to say about it? Well, I look at Jesus. Jesus, by the way, this is a gospel issue. He called his disciples friends. So he stopped relating to them. And, and how do you define friendship? I think it was through discourse. He let them in on God's redemptive history and plan and his own heart and what was happening in him. And so I think we can't be friends if you keep yourself completely hidden. Now, you can't make yourself known to everyone, but part of developing friendship is letting yourself be known and, and taking your guard down. And then, then I look at, like, how do you cultivate those friendships? Jesus seemed to have a relationship where he wasn't just working himself up to the powerful and the polished. It seemed yeah. like he had to work against that. <laughs> Very opposite. That. Yeah. Very opposite. So, <laughs> so we should have these relationships that shock the world, where you are an accomplished writer and um, you've achieved some things in your life, and yet you still have your neighbor who over and in and, and, and very different places. And so we want to have tables that I think look shocking. We want to have relationships that still look gospel shocking. And so um, I think the gospel frees us to do that because we, we're not trying to identify ourselves as people who work our way up. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so anyways, any other thoughts on Bible friendship? How do we yeah. then have to learn from what the Bible has to say? And then how do we practice this thing? Yeah, let's get practical. I uh, I just want to make one other comment too, just for church leaders who are listening. Uh, we we need to be careful not to content ourselves with gathering a crowd. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a church is not a crowd. A church is a body, right. and and I think that um, sometimes that. Well, it, it requires an, a level of intentionality in saying the communities that we're developing, the circles that mm. we're developing are, are really important. And then I think, you know, what we did in our, in our meetings w- was to say, okay, <laughs> there are some skills that we need to build here, you right. know, and so let's, let's do these, let's do these, let's push people towards practical obedience in this area. And yeah. so um, we were trying to uh, overcome some obstacles. One of them was just basically recalling men to choose it. Yes. Um, so, I mean, anybody who wants to be a friend has to say, yes, I want to be a friend. Yep. And uh, I want to enter into that sort of covenant relationship where there's a commitment. And that is hard because, I mean, friendship has to be organic. Like, right. like uh, oftentimes it works where you're, you're sort of side by side doing yep. things and then it sort of grows into, no, face to face, I care about you. Yes. I'm, I'm taking yep. that from Trevor. Um, but uh, so there has to be like... Both goodwill, like I want good for you, but also yeah. a, a connection, like yeah. like we we care Chemistry, about each other. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. exactly. Um, but the big thing that we practiced in our in yes. our gathering was just like, how do you have a conversation? Yes, because uh, we've all been in conversation with people who ask no questions of us. You know, wow. we're just kind of carrying carrying the load, and we we had this whole visual thing that Kurt Hofer oh, yeah. uh, shared with us. Yeah, but. yeah, practical tools on this, and, and I think the art of conversation is something we need to grow in. I think we live in this isolated world where we consume media. It's a one-way thing. Uh, We make quick posts, but it's not a dialogue. And so the space to have healthy, interesting, uh, even if I can use the word intimate dialogue, um, is is maybe a weakened skill. And so, yeah, just literally being a great question asker. One of my little principles is try to be interested in the other person instead of just trying to be an interesting person. And so if you're always just boasting about little things you've figured out or little things you've done, that is a little bit off-putting versus just taking the humble road of saying, tell me about where you're from. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your passions. Tell me about some of your burdens. Tell me about your pain points. Um, Tell me about some of your hopes and dreams. Those are, you know, when you show interest and let the conversation flow, that can be really beautiful. So Yeah. Listening is a rare skill, honestly. Yeah. And, uh, but it is such a gift to, to someone to listen to them. Yeah. To, you're giving the gift of, of attention yeah. so that they feel like, like you feel them, like, yes. like you can understand what it's like to be them. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, I think there's, 
strong and weak re- ways of relating in any friendship. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to have mutual interests or plans or things you're excited about. But um, especially it especially gets deep when you start talking about the things that you're concerned about or the things that, um, you know, are burdening you down. So yeah. mutuality and suffering is a, is a huge one. Yeah. And the capacity to enter there, to go yes. there, to ask that question. Yes. And then to, to em- empathetically mm-hmm. respond. Yeah. And yeah. And to be vulnerable because yeah. that oftentimes that's what opens the door. Yeah. We found that in our men's Bible study is just getting oh. men to tell their stories in front of everyone in, in a way that's hard, that's yes. vulnerable, that's risky, yes. opens up the floodgates at, at the tables. Yeah. Yep. So. Yep. There's so many great practicals, but so you guys are ministry leaders and you're evaluating what does it look like to pull off this space? Kids ministry. What does it look like to pull off this? There's always two things happening. There's the ministry that's happening. And like, we're trying to just get through men's Bible study and teach true truths of John. Um, you know, there's the Sunday morning kids gathering. You're just trying to get the, your volunteers in spaces they need to be. But be aware of how we can be cultivating brotherhood and sisterhood and friendship in the midst of those spaces. Um, I think what really helped our group go to another level in our men's ministry was just starting to go to lunch, starting to text each other outside of that group, starting to, to invite people around tables and developing real relationships. That has been the glue. And I just want to say to the pastors and leaders, the the thing we oftentimes think is going to make our church, you know, really healthy and sticky is the right preaching and right worship and right programs. It really oftentimes comes down to, does they make one friend? Did they make one friend that genuinely cares about their life, their story, uh, their pain? Uh, if we can help people experience gospel friendship, um, I don't think it just makes our church healthier. I think it obviously is a ministry to real people to the point, Matt, where I have literally heard from wives. Uh, my wife has had conversations with others and and one of the quotes of, of her, one of her girlfriends is, we drop everything we're doing to hang out with you and your family anytime you asked us because I literally just want my husband to be friends with your husband. Uh, I want him to have people who care about him and ask unique questions about his marriage and his soul and he doesn't have a friend like that. Wow, that is unbelievable that we live in a world that you can be known by everyone and not have one friend that's rooting for you in ways that are really matters. So uh, let's labor for churches that look different than that. Amen. Yeah. So, amen. Yeah. Anything, Matt, closing thoughts? That was it. Amen. Okay. You got everything out of us. So go and be a friend, text somebody today, line up a lunch, uh, call them, let them know you, it, their friendship matters. Uh, let's be people who practice gospel centered friendship with one another. Thanks so much. City Life family. We'll talk to you guys next time.